today I will, I will be talking about uh, the machine learning approach that we used uh, Mango to optimize prices during clearance sales. And I will give you some tips on how to uh, implement data science into, into business. First of all, as uh, Santi already said, um, I'm a physicist. Uh, I have an MSc and, and a PhD on, on physical oceanography, so I've basically been studying a uh, long, long time series and doing some predictive uh, modeling during, during the past years. Um, and I joined Mango early this year to apply this knowledge of uh, predictive um, tools and predictive algorithms to, to the business. Um, so the contents of this talk will be, first of all, we'll talk a little bit about Mango. Um, I'm pretty sure it doesn't need a good, really big introduction. Pretty much you all know the company. Um, but I will explain uh, the advanced analytics department and what we do there. Um, then we'll talk about retail in general. So we have an immense amount of data, uh, any retailer does and how to work with the data and how to actually um, implement the data into the decision making. That's extremely difficult and it's key nowadays. Uh, I will present a use case. I will talk about the algorithm that we use to predict which is the optimal price during sale season for each item of the collection. Um, and I will give you some tools or, well, some tips um, about what we learn in the process. So, Mango. Um, it's a pretty huge company. Basically, these are data from 2017. Um, but uh, we are present in more than 100 countries. We have a uh, revenue in 2018 of 2.2 billion euros. So it's, it's pretty, pretty huge. Um, the important thing here is that Mango is a familiar company. It started uh, as a small business and it started to grow. Um, so it's possible to, you know, ex you, you need to think first small and then big. Um, and it happens the same in data science or in data engineering. You need to start small and start building things and you can create something huge as Mango, for instance. Um, some um, um, data, some, some dates. Um, we're a pretty old business. We started our business in 1984 with the first shop here in Barcelona. Um, so it was kind of long time ago. Um, and the interesting fact here is that in 2000, we opened our online selling portal. So it's basically almost 20 years since we are a business that combines both worlds, offline and online. Um, and this gives us this omni-channel experience of the client. And we, are, we always try to think of the client as a whole, um, not only online, not only offline, but both worlds together. And that's also something that in data science you need to, to have in mind because things are not individual, but things normally go together. Um, here it ends in 2017, but in 2018, the advanced analytics department was created. Um, Mango, of course, had um, old business, um, all BI, let's say that way, um, platform and, and departments. It has a huge data warehouse platform. Um, and all their reporting and dashboarding were um, created from the, from the data house um, uh, platform. And so, because of, of course, um, from 2000, there was an online uh, portal, so all the information and uh, records and everything, it's, it's um, safe in our platform. Um, but the advanced analytics department is trying to go a step further. It's not only about BI, it's about giving or giving the support to the company to making decisions, making informed decisions. So we are trying to achieve a data-driven organization and we're trying to improve the company through machine learning as well, through uh, AI. So where are we right now? Right now we are in the point of trying to um, create or creating this big data platform. This big data platform is, um, it, it, it's, it's like we have the, the old uh, data warehouse platform. So we are trying to implement this data into the big data platform. So we have um, the right base 
from which we can start building a data science team. Um, to be able to obtain the information and to apply the models, you need to have the right base, the right plan for you cannot create a team or you cannot obtain um, real value from the data um, creating uh, uh, or building something vertical. You need to be uh, aware that first you need a good base and then you need to start creating. And this is what Mango is doing. Mango um, last year in 2018 started the advanced analytics department. We are five people only, so it's a small team that has this um, base on, on top, this base layer, so we can grow on top. And this is basic for any organization to have a good base to start creating and building um, or bringing the information and the data to the business. <sighs> retail. In retail, we have a whole universe of data. We have millions of data. Um, on the data, for instance, we are um, having a TCPP of a few uh, dozens of gigabytes per day, so it's, it's pretty enormous. But we also have, in Teradata, basically we are saving uh, things like the tickets or the sales from the uh, stores, uh, the stocks that we have, um, the, um, uh, the transport systems, the, there's, there's a lot of um, data that is saved uh, right there. Uh, the transactions, for instance, but we also have uh, on Salesforce, we have the marketing cloud. We also have the Google Analytics from our website uh, that we are using BigQuery to, to query. We also have our Oracle database that we store all the things like uh, the feeds and so on. Um, we also have the information from the feed finder, and we also have the uh, smart wardrobe information. So there's a lot of information that can get, is stored in our database and that we need to to query and we need to, you know, um, get inf get um, value from. How to do that? How do you actually um, decide where to put your focus, where to ask the questions, or which questions should be answered? Um, basically, there are three key words that I think will bring you that information. First of all, um, the initiatives that you that you do has to be have to be actionable. They have to be measurable, and they have to have a real business impact. Why? Because if you don't put the focus on these types of actions, um, you will not bring value and uh, confidence into the business. Again, you need to build a really strong base, and then start building from there. Start small, but start in a you know, continuous pace. So do not try to build the Eiffel Tower the first day. First, learn how to um, do a house, then a village, and so on. So this is what they need to, to be done, or at least is what we have learned that it, it works. Um, so our use case. I'm going to present here the markdown optimization model for the sales season. It's called uh, Midas. Um, this project was meant to find the optimal price to maximize project uh, profit. Sorry, um, after all, it for each product. So basically, the question that we like to answer is, which is the optimal discount during the sales season? Why um, this project? Why this one and not any other one? First of all, it was actionable. We had all the data in the right place, and we know where the data was, so we could actually query the data. Um, it was measurable, because we were able to do an A-B testing to measure the success of the project. And, ha and it had a real impact, because it increased the mean prof profitability during sales season. So that's something that's extreme power. But not only that, Midas not only affected the revenue, that of course it, it, it it does, but it also have this free and complete vision of the process that is give support and the, it, it's a support and it's a tool that the project managers can use to take the informed decisions so they know um, which is the optimal price so that they that have the field knowledge can take a better decision. And it also has knowledge 
because the project help to um, help to build knowledge of the of the unit and br brought uh, to the uh, stakeholders the confidence that the advanced analytics department could do um, machine learning approaches and can take you know bring data into the top level. How um, have we achieved that? So first of all, um, we prepared the data. We, do, we did all the data preparations and insights. Um, so we uh, obtained the recent purchases, the stocks, price elasticity, shops, for instance, and other variables. Um, so uh, first you need to find the, the variables that are right, and then you need to uh, measure the variable importance um, from your model. Then we, bought, we built the machine learning algorithm um, using a random forest. Um, basically, we uh, train, test, and give a prediction using the variables from the historical um, from the historical data. And then the price optimization that was like the biggest challenge. Um, okay, so you have a prediction based on the uh, historical record for each product, but how do you find which is the most optimal price? Um, we created a matrix with all the possible price points that an item can have um, for each week during the, the clearing sales. Um, so we gave a prediction, uh, a forecast prediction for that uh, item, that price, for each week. So once you got the prediction, you can calculate the margin after all it, um, uh, the profit uh, for each particular case, and then if you rank um, the margin, you can find which is the optimal price um, for that item. So I'm gonna explain that in more detail because it's a bit, you know, tricky. Um, basically, we created a, a combination like this. So this table is uh, a combination of IDs. Uh, this combination of price points, it's, this is an ID, ID1, ID255, ID 1241, ID uh, 2219, and so on, right? Um, combination number one is the lowest possible prices, so 4.99 for each week. Combination number two will be 5.99 the first week, 4.99 the second week, 4.99 ta, 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 and so on. Um, combination 2.55 is 17.99 the first week, 15.99 the same the second week, and so on, right? Um, and these are three cases that I will show now on the next slide. This is the same table that we had. Um, it was eight weeks, but I just cut it into four just to remember the, the table, okay? And this is the theoretical margin for each uh, combination of price points for each model. So the, the curve, uh, the red curve is, um, is one model, one item, okay? Um, the yellow one is another one, and the blue one is another item. So three different items. Um, with all of the three of those have uh, the same table, right? Like this. Um, so what we did is use the um, uh, machine learning algorithm that we built before to give a prediction of sales based on those prices. So if, you, if we consider um, item, uh, the red item, it's here, right? For the combination of price points number seven, so it would be something like 7.99, 5.99, and so on, has a margin of X euros, whatever, um, it's really cheap, so you sell everything in the first two weeks, and then you don't have any left over. Um, another combination, another possible combination is, for instance, 500, and you get more margin because you are selling more, but also you're having more left over. Which is the um, optimal combination? The optimal combination is that, that gives you um, sales, so in this case, a minus 10, and you got 10 of left over, but it gives you the, the maximum margin. So basically for each prediction, for each forecast, you will have a margin for the possible combinations. I'm not quite sure if that goes clear, but if you have any questions, ask me, ask, you can ask me later. Um, so um, the challenge, the mathematical challenge was there to find the uh, optimization. But we also had to measure. How do you measure the success of this project? 
Uh, to measure, we did an A-B testing using the legacy method that was um, how they put prices on, on the past. That was basically um, a person that knows uh, the field, a project manager, was taking the decisions and analyzing all the data and putting the prices for each item. And the new method was using Midas um, and to give uh, a pre-created list of prices to the same person uh, or to the equivalent person of, the, of another country and they can take the decision based on the data that we already give them. So based on the data. Um, we measure the, so I'm not quite sure if you know how to measure the results of an AV testing. We used a difference of differences approach. It's a really easy method, a statistical, um, it's, it's not really, um, uh, it's not really difficult, but it's uh, significant. So basically, you, well, this is supposed to be a Europe map. I'm not quite sure why it's not, you cannot really see it, but okay. Um, we've got different countries which we were implemented the methods, uh, and we divided all our items in different families. Uh, what we did was compare the results obtained in one country or another, um, it divides, for instance, in one zone and another zone, so the two different countries. We used the um, legacy method for the families A and the new minus method for the families A in the in the uh, uh, in the other area. Um, the difference between the results in so the probability that we obtain um, on A versus B was a three percent. So B performed three percent better in zone two than in zone A for families A. In, um, for families B, there are shirts and skirts, um, the Midas method and the legacy method um, perform equally. But we had a third family, so dress, jacket, jeans, sweater, and rack and leather, that we applied the Midas method on those two areas. So basically, you have like a layer so we have a way to see what's the difference between zones um, using the same method. D versus F perform a minus 2%, so D perform 2% two, two better than F. That means that the difference between these two are always the same. So basically, you got a 3% here for families A, A but you need to rest this 2% that perform different. So you've got an impact, of, a real impact of Midas of 1%. Here, they look like they perform the same, but they didn't because they know that the difference between zones are minus two. So basically, is this one, it's O um, plus two, because uh, remember that we are changing here, right? Midas is here or here. So we've got an impact of Midas of 2%. So if we did the uh, uh, mean of those, we got a uh, mean impact of 1.5%. These are, of course, just examples of data. Um, but you see there's a way to actually measure the success of the project. Once um, you have actioned the project and obtained a significant impact, like in this case, um, you need to focus on how to scale it. Um, it's really important you keep in mind that um, you not only need to measure because um, you need to have a number. It's really important to measure because you need to understand the dynamics that are applying on your project. So when you scale it, because it's going to happen, it's always going to happen, um, you need to understand how to scale it properly. You need to, again, build a good base and take the decisions that will help you grow on top of that base. Do not try to grow fast and vertically, but create a good base and then start from there. What have we learned? What tips can I give you? Um, especially if you are starting a small project uh, and you are just trying to showcase uh, what you can do with um, AI or machine learning. First of all, your code. Be prepared for the future. Because now you're maybe in a small team, you're by yourself writing code, and it's like, yeah, I'm going to try to do something, and I'm doing an experiment. Um, but then 
you will start, you know, writing more and more code, and somehow you end up like with 20,000 lines of code, and you need to scale that or give that to someone else or so on, and it's a mess. It's a complete mess. So remember, be flexible. Utilize, um, use um, parameterizations, use variables, because do not hard code anything, because data changes, because parameters changing, because changes, because assumptions sometimes changes. So keep that in mind when you write your code. Make it scalable. At least try to keep that in mind, because you will have it to scale it, scale it if it works. And please. Document everything because you're not alone and be really, really organized. These are best practices that are basic for any project in data science. So, for instance, use Git. It's really important to um, be really organized on the um, versions that you're using and be able to reproduce the code in the, in the past, in the future, sorry. Um, it's extremely helpful sometimes. Um, interpretability is key. Do not focus on precision, okay? It's not really important if you obtain an accuracy of 0.70 or 0.71%. What is really important is to get the job done. You will always have to make assumptions. I mean, it, it's not that you, it's like, I need to put uh, uh, in production an extreme difficult machine learning algorithm, uh, deep learning that I don't really understand, but I want to use it. No. Just remember, try to use the tool that give you um, the, the, that you feel more comfortable with and that you can um, understand well, okay? Um, try to get the job done. That's the most important part of it. Um, and if you um, cannot explain what your algorithm does, you will have a big problem. Why? Because one, you will not be aware of the assumptions that you were making or the limitations that you have, and two, no one will understand what you are actually doing. If you cannot communicate your results to the stakeholders, um, you will lose um, their confidence. They will not um, believe what the results are. So if you doubt, use the grandma principle. If you cannot explain it to your grandma, if your grandma cannot understand what you are saying, no one can, trust me. Um, team. A solo mission is a suicide mission. I mean, it's impossible to do things alone. So surround yourself with a diverse team, not only in gender, but in background and experience. Because a diverse team will give you a different approach uh, to the same problem. So if you can approach a problem from different perspective, you will most likely have a, a better solution, and you will probably obtain the solution in a faster and a smarter way. <sighs> what problem do we have with data science? Um, one of the main problems that we have is that we want to do modeling. We want to do modeling and we don't really care about the data. No, like, it's okay, it's okay. It's not okay. You need good engineers to help you with infrastructure. You need a good base in which create things on top, to build models on top of that. And of course, be really, really aware of your needs. There's a huge big data ecosystem. Um, you can use Azure, you can use Amazon Web Services, you can um, put a Spark on top uh, with uh, Databricks or without Databricks, and then you can also, uh, why do you use Cloudera, why do you put, uh, there's, there's a lot of fuzzy words. Uh, let's use Hadoop, well, you mean, what, what, what it means to use Hadoop? Let's, let's be aware of our needs. Um, it's extremely important because it doesn't, it, it's not about the tools. It's about how do you use the right tools for the right problem. Um, I really like this, cute, this quote that says, you can have data without information, but you cannot have information without data. And for me, it's extremely true. Um, information is really, really, really key. Because if you don't have the information, if you don't have the knowledge to take the informed decisions, um, you can have a lot of data, but you have nothing, right? Um, so just um, final remarks. Um, we really need to take informed decisions because knowledge is key. It's extremely important to bring um, not only the data, but the knowledge that comes from the data to the business. 
there are a lot of opportunities to sit in the business decision making. Um, there's a ton of rooms for growth and to develop ID tools, but it's really important that our projects are actionable, measurable, and that has an impact, because otherwise, in the long run, we will not succeed. So keep that in mind if you want to be able to create a good project. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and just a uh, quick note on that. We are hiring, <laughs> uh, as everybody else in the world. Um, but actually, I'm really looking for someone to um, give me a hand on um, creating, uh, uh, the, uh, to bring the model into, um, into the big data science pro, um, platform. So I'm really looking for someone that has knowledge of Spark and can develop tools on a big data ecosystem. So if you are any of those people, just give me a call or, well, ping me a, me a message there, and I will be really happy to talk to you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmen. I very much agree with you on the importance of extracting the actionable knowledge from the results of the data science. That's, for me, that's a big gap that we have to research a lot on that because it's not well solved, it's not well, uh, there's not a well m methodology that helps to follow this gap. Uh, some of us are working on that for years, and, but I think it's, it's really important that people like you uh, uh, from the other side uh, express this need to stimulate the academy to concentrate a little bit more efforts on, on that point. Thank you. Uh, also, um, you have been talking about the A-B test, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you were making like a kind of two sample, two sample uh, test uh, yep. comparison, right? So my question is, how do you decide which is zone A and zone, and zone B? I mean, um, which kind of, uh, of criteria are you using? Are they areas in the same city or to, to guarantee the homogeneity on the two? on the two areas compared and to be sure that the, that the differences are about the treatment and Sorry. not about other co-variables? Um, there's a different ways to approach it. We've done uh, this, this uh, two times uh, and we have used different approaches on, on both. Uh, basically, one of the times what we did it was, of course, we don't want different prices on the same country. Uh, so basically, what we've done is find areas of uh, one country or yeah, one country uh, with uh, um, one country uh, in another country that are comparable in terms of number of shops, uh, climate, for instance, also revenue that we obtain. So the areas are comparable between them. That's one of the main things. And we have done that on different countries, um, not to have, you know. And, and uh, how is the cultural context um, uh, role on this thing because I guess that when you are comparing areas in terms of this kind of a very objective uh, a very objective criteria uh, the differences might be not because of the method but because of some other issues that rely to something that you are not measuring in fact I mean exactly um, you cannot have a uh, totally comparable area. That's one of the limitations that we have with this method. when you are changing country, right? Especially. Yeah. E even without, within a country, I mean, there's how do you have a sample big enough to be representative and significant, but uh, also to be exactly the same as uh, in another place? For instance, imagine Russia. If we divide Russia into regions, they are not comparable at all. Um, but maybe, but what we thought is, okay, but let's try to find countries that are more or less similar, so especially within Europe, like France, it's somehow similar so to at Germany. Least you, keep, you keep on the same kind of... Um, yeah, in the same region. Okay. Uh, so they are more or less, I mean, Homogenous they are not going to be exactly, but at least they will be more similar. Okay. Like, it's not China with, um, I don't know, with USA, for instance but they are close enough to be more or less similar, and the climate is more or less similar yeah, too. because this is one of the most challenging issues as well when, it is. <laughs> when you are uh, w talking about making real tests, no? 
Of course, yeah, it's yeah. extremely complicated. For instance, um, Italy and Portugal are also similar, or Spain and Portugal. Okay. You know, they try to, but you need also always to make assumptions, and you cannot say this is the result and it's absolutely true, because nothing is absolutely true. We know <laughs> Thank that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I also have a question regarding the A-B testing, but before yeah. going on my question, I'd like to also announce that I'm also hiring, so before you speak to her, maybe you can come to me. I think I offer <laughs> something better. Sorry, I had. So I saw in your slide you were comparing legacy with what you call Midas in yep. A, B, and C. Nevertheless, in, in one of the groups, you were mm -hmm. not comparing legacy unless I misunderstood yep. something. There yeah. So what were you comparing in C? That's the first question. And my mm -hmm. second question, how did you choose to target your audience for the A-B test? With what share of the traffic? And how did you make sure to not have, um, to not overcross the audience? Okay, so basically, how do we decide family C? We try A and B that were the uh, group test to be as similar as, um, as possible, but we didn't want to do the test on all the families, so we are resting impact uh, to the test. So we're trying basically to find 20% uh, of our families or our, uh, models to be the target of, uh, of the test. Um, and then uh, the A-B testing were uh, done on uh, both platforms, offline and online, not, uh, for different countries. Um, so basically, we were choosing just about the countries related with the previous question, um, not about just the uh, audience, but the, the uh, country from which the audience come from. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. I'm, I'm curious about the previous section where you specified that you created a random forest for mm -hmm. predicting sales. Yep. Um, I have various questions, but uh, I want to understand, basically you put different prices yep. and you have different price points. How, yeah, how did you come up with those numbers? That's the first The question. universe of price points is something that is um, uh, common for the whole Mango company. So we have a universe, a created universe of price points. Okay. So you cannot put any price. The okay, price then, points are discrete. Okay, and then you predict sales on each of those of those prices on the whole season at the same time. Yeah. So basically, what we uh, do is predict the sales that we, you you will have um, when you put those prices on see, the on the and then. Whole. Okay, so this relates to my second question, which is basically uh, I know you are more in the fast fashion, more not hundred percent, but you, your items tend to change a lot. How do you tackle the cost star problem? Because you, you're gonna predict things, you're gonna predict on top of products that you've never seen in your catalog. What we predict, because we are predicting the sale season, and the sale season um, already has the season uh, behind. So we have the historical data of this season with the models that are right now uh, in the shops. Mm -hmm. So we are not predicting something that we don't know how it's going to work with the client. Mm -hmm. We already have that knowledge because we are right now selling the stuff. So, for instance, the next season, uh, the next sales season will be in January. Uh, so, from August to December, we have the data of how this item has been has been sold. Did you try time series before trying random forest? I guess you've tried different models, yep. but why random forest in the end? Because it was understandable. Okay. Because it gave us results, it was understandable, and it was easy to implement. It was fast. There's no other reason. Okay. We could change a random forest, or we can change. We could cho choose. Sorry, a random forest, or we could have choose another thing. Um, it worked for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I have the same question. <laughs> so the additional question: uh, What the uh, what the loss function uh, have you used for the random forest? Maybe it custom function loss, a mean square error or mean. I error. use the accuracy and the root mean square error. Yeah, uh, both between because it depends on what we were um, analyzing as uh, the error of the of the accuracy of the of the, the of the model. Um, I used different approaches over the time, um, but. Mainly, uh, I think in the last version it was a uh, square error. Yeah. Just a small comment. Yeah. Uh, when you say that uh, random forest is understandable, in my in my <laughs> <laughs> in my experience, for me, it's very easy to understand a decision tree, a single decision tree, 
when I have a random forest, I really feel a little bit lost on understandability. So at that point, uh, how, how do you manage the, the well, interpretation of the random forest? Yeah, because um, um, it's extremely true. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like that. Um, I choose the random forest um, for interpretability because it was complex enough to translate the difficulty of the problem and to the stakeholders. And also because I can um, print something like that with the variables. So I can actually tell in a visual way, OK, so this is what we have. These are our variables. This is, and it's a really good way to communicate. And for me, it, help, it helped a lot. Um, I agree with you, it's not totally understandable. But at least being able to show how the variables are related between each other helped me a lot. But uh, you must choose a, 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 a small subset of, yeah. of decision trees to do yeah. that. So you maximize those that are performing better or something like yeah. that. Okay, thank you.